Good afternoon, everyone. I've been instructed I have to speak in the proximity of this microphone because they're, one of the things we're doing is actually videotaping the session. So those who can attend one, you'll find it posted on RHLink. So just to kick things off, I wanted to say to everyone, thank you very much. And welcome to the session on behalf of ELT. Thank you so much for participating in the survey. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm very pleased with the re response rate uh, from our full timers. Uh, as you'll see, the importance of, of, of your input means is directly related to the success we'll have in developing and, and implementing a plan. So we're going to hear this afternoon uh, from our uh, illustrious consultant, Norm. Uh, I always get your, your name inverted. Bailey David. Uh, I always want to say David Bailey. But anyway, uh, from, uh, from our uh, talent map. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll go through the results and we'll take some questions at the end. And then I'll let you know what's, uh, what's the, the next steps in the process and, and get your feedback. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Norm Bailey David, Engagement Manager with Talent Map, the company we've worked with to develop the survey. Norm has more than 25 years of experience in survey research, employee engagement, and organizational development issues. Norm has also worked extensively in the fields of innovation, creativity, and strategic planning, and specializes in helping employees and leaders develop new approaches to jumpstart employee engagement. Norm has worked with organizations in various industries and sizes, including a number of municipalities. I also wanted to let you know, just before Norm comes, that this presentation will be emailed to all staff um, right after the last session, which is on Thursday, I believe, at the Op Center. So, so whether you're here or not, and again, it's, it's going to be, this presentation will actually uh, be videoed and posted on RHLink too. So we got it, hopefully we got it covered. Hopefully everyone can take the time to, to see it if you're not here in person. So without further ado, Norm. Thank you very much, Neil. So I'm your after lunch entertainment. That's going to be challenging. All right. I'm up for the challenge. All right, here we go. So what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon, essentially, is I'm going to mirror back the results of the survey. Hopefully, you'll see yourselves in there. Before I get into the actual results, I want to take you into a little bit of an explanation around what we're actually talking about when we talk about the term employee engagement or engaged employee. Because there's a lot of myths and misnomers about what that actually means. So we're going to get into a little bit of an explanation, not too long, but five minutes or so. Then we'll talk about the engagement level itself, how many people fit that description. And I'm not going to go through all the results to all the questions. You might have a burning question or I want to know who said what about this or that. If there's something that you don't see, then ask me afterwards and it's going to all be in that presentation anyway. What I want to really focus on though is what's called the drivers of engagement. And the drivers of engagement are three or four themes that have emerged through your own responses to the survey. The things that you are saying are the most important in terms of determining whether or not you're going to engage with the town of Richmond Hill or not. That's where we'll spend some time. We'll look at that in, terms of, in some more detail to understand what that is, why so many people are engaged, why some are disengaged, and what is it we can do to get more people to be engaged. And essentially that's what I want to achieve in the next hour or so. Feel free, if you've got a burning question, no problem, ask the question, I have no problem with that. You can wait till the end, we can do that too. Uh, but I'll take questions before, after, during, it really doesn't matter. If I see we're, gonna, we're getting a little bit bogged down, then I'll, I'll park it towards the end, okay? So the way I like to start this presentation is by saying two things. The first is congratulations, and the second is thank you. Now, Neil already thanked you uh, very much, and I'll do the same, but congratulations for an organization to have taken this step. Because it's not easy, and some of the stuff that you're going to see over the course of the next hour, you're probably going to be a little bit wide-eyed at. And, uh, you know, really? They're, he's telling us that? Yeah, I am. Because the, the, Congratulations for really total honesty and transparency in this whole process. And I think that's really important for you to remember. Not all organizations are, are this open with this type of information. So keep that in mind. 
But at the same time, what we have to remember is I'm not here at the end of a survey and then I'm going to go home. I'm here at the beginning of a process. And so we're only here, if you look at that cycle, we're only at step 2.1. So we've done the measurement, we did the survey, you did the survey, thank you very much. And we've done the analysis back at Talent Map, and now I'm going to present you the results. But if it stops there, then this whole exercise has been for naught. Really what has to happen is essentially you take hold of the results and start to have conversations here at the town around how do we get more people to engage? How do we engage more of us? Uh, and that really is uh, around developing a plan. You'll talk about a little bit of those next steps after I'm done in terms of what's going to happen with this from a procedural or process point of view. But from uh, an engagement point of view, this won't work unless you participate in it. Because I've seen too often management teams sit around the boardroom table and say, how are we going to improve engagement? And they come up with these, what they think is wonderful ideas. And then they present them to staff and staff say, well, you didn't ask me. And it doesn't go anywhere from there. Well, of course not. It has to come from you. And as I'm going to explain to you in a second, you own your own engagement. Nobody can give you that. You have to decide. So essentially what it is now is how are we going to decide? What, is, what are we actually talking about with the term employee engagement? What is, who is an engaged employee? Best way to think about this is to think about a recent customer service experience you've had, either on the phone with an airline, a cable company, what have you, or down at the food court, or Tim's, or Starbucks, or whatever. You've had an interface with a person, an individual, for about 30 seconds or so. And in that brief moment in time, you can tell instinctively, human to human, whether or not that person is an engaged employee or not. You're not thinking about it. Next time you have one of those, you might think about it. And how can you tell? Well, contrary to other things that we used to measure in terms of employee satisfaction or whether or not how many employees are happy in their jobs, the engaged employee behaves differently. So the person that you're interfacing with is going to, they're going to behave in a certain way that's going to give you clues that the person really must be engaged or that person is really disengaged. And some of those clues are the engaged individual is going to go the extra mile. This is the person that's going to bend over backwards to help you. They're going to bend around. They're going to go out of their way to make sure that that interaction with you is successful and fruitful. And I'm not just talking about a customer situation. I'm talking about any human interaction in the organization. right? So they're the people who are going to take initiative. They're the people who are going to... Like I said, go the extra mile, bend over backwards, all of those euphemisms that you can think about. But that's what gives it away. Those are the behaviors, the outward. So you don't have to read anybody's mind to, to say, are you engaged or are you engaged? You're going to behave differently. And that's different from customer or sort of employee satisfaction or happy employees, which I hear all the time. Employee engagement, well, that's just an HR buzzword for how happy we are, how satisfied we are. Well, it's not because... I can sit down two employees, one happy, one not happy. I can't tell the difference. You will not behave outwardly any differently in the organization. Well, you might think, well, wait a second. The unhappy person is not going to do as good a job. Yes, they will. They're professionals. They're gonna, they're gonna, they need to get paid too. They don't want to get fired. So they're going to do their job just like the happy person or the satisfied person who's content. Everything's hunky-dory. I'm going to do my job. But neither one, if they're not engaged, if they're just happy or satisfied, will go the extra mile. And that's what we're talking about. We want people to essentially feel that way so that they do go the extra mile. How do you get somebody into that state of mind? We've talked about the hands. The way you get there is head and heart. So there's two things that we're looking at. Part of this is logical. It's rational. It's uh, essentially... I'm going to look at my job situation and say, does this make sense to me? Is this a good thing for me? Am I getting paid properly? Is this good for my career? Is my work safe? Is my, do I like my office? Are the plants watered? All of those types of things will enter into the rational part of the equation. We've got to watch that. Um, the thing is here, the rational stuff is very, very keenly felt before you start your new job. So on day zero, day minus one, you've accepted an offer. 
And at that point, those rational considerations are what decided, what made you decide, yes, I'm going to come and work for the town. Of, I'm going to accept that offer because it pays well, it's a good career, all of those rational things. On day one, day two, those things don't become, those things aren't important anymore. They're in place, they're set, I've agreed to them, and am I going to be more engaged? Am I going to go the extra mile because of that? Not necessarily, very rarely. What takes over is the heart. And what each and every one of us are doing, without knowing it, is we're evaluating a whole series of signals that come from different people in the organization, but not only people, programs and policies that have been put in place. Everything, all of these things, our relationship with our boss, our relationship with our coworkers and our peers, managers, our relationship with our subordinates, our, our interface with the public, even that plays into how engaged we are. How? Well, what we're doing is we're evaluating all of these relationships and interfaces and touch points and we're asking ourselves, do we, does the organization care about me? Through all of this, how do I deduce? Do, does, the, does the town of Richmond Hill care about me as an individual? And if I come to the conclusion that, yeah, most of the time it does. Yes, it does. The town of Richmond Hill cares about me. Well, wow, I'm going to care back. And when that's the foundation, now you have an embryo that's going to lead to engagement because I care about the town of Richmond Hill. I'm going to go the extra mile for the town of Richmond Hill. I'm going to bend over backwards for the town of Richmond Hill. Why? Because they care about me. And I can sit down again, two individuals, and I can see one is, if one has told me or we deduce that that person is an engaged employee and the other one's not, I can have a conversation with them and it takes about 10 minutes before it all boils down to one common denominator. And that common denominator is caring. The engaged individual at some point in that conversation will tell me, yeah, the town of Richmond Hill really cares about its people. My boss really cares about his or her people. The disengaged or not engaged individual will say, they don't give a rats about me. That's the fundamental difference. So then how do we get more people to understand, to feel cared about? Herein lies the challenge for any organization, right? So you got a lot of, I apologize for the small text, small screens. We got about 16 or 17, we call these the dimensions of engagement. Ranging from compensation, work environment, performance feedback, professional growth, work-life balance, I won't read them all. Some of them appeal more to the rational side, others appeal more to the emotional side, some of them appeal to both. But these are all things that over time with a lot of research and experience, We've established that all of these have some level of impact on one's level of engagement. So what happens? Well, the first thing is there's lots of different issues there. And those of you who did the survey might remember that the survey was 68 questions long. We asked about each one of those themes. And under each theme, there was a number of specific attitudes. Yet not all of those are important in engaging you. Only a very select few are. So the good news is we don't have to juggle all these balls. We just have to know which ones are the right balls to juggle. And we need to do those things right. And we also know that if we're doing those things right, that's what's going to result in a high level of engagement. We're going to figure out, we're going to show you what the dri those drivers of engagement are for the town of Richmond Hill in a couple of minutes. So when we're doing those right things right, more and more people are going to feel what we see in column two. They're going to be proud to say you work here. You're going to be focused. You're going to be optimistic about the future. You're going to be inspired, emotionally invested, dedicated to doing a good job. All of those feelings, you can even feel it rise up. When you feel those things, you're going to want to go the extra mile for the people around you, for the, for the town of Richmond Hill. And that's when you start doing those behaviors, not because you want to, but because, no, sorry, not because you have to, but because you genuinely want to. And when you've got a lot of people in an organization that is its people, like the town of Richmond Hill, then of course the organization is going to perform better. It's going to do a better job because you've got more people going the extra mile, more people that are bending over backwards. So essentially all of those result in key business outcomes. So you're going to have a better experience. The people who you're dealing with in the public are going to have a better experience with you if you're engaged. It makes sense. 
right? There's gonna, you're going to want to stay here, employee retention. You're going to want to come to work, lower absenteeism, right? And on and on it goes. The organization with a higher level of engagement performs better, and that's proven in research, okay? So essentially, it, it all works through that, and that's what we're going to show you over the next few minutes. I want to digress a little bit, talk about confidentiality, because it's a very, very important point. And throughout this entire process, I'm sure some of you have been wondering, if this is the first time you did one of these especially, what's happening with my results? I, put, I filled in that survey and I clicked on submit, now what happens? Somebody, is my boss going to see this? No. Your boss is not going to see your individual results. What we do at TalentMap is we make sure that there is no individual results are, are made available. So the data resides with us on our servers in Ottawa. Right. So, essentially, the access is provided in two ways. So, we provide a series of reports that go down, and you'll see eventually you'll be exposed. This is the overall report that you're seeing today for the entire town uh, and the town's employees. You're going to see your own department results uh, as we go through over the, over the next weeks and months. So, that's how it's going to roll out. But, at some point, you get to groups that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You get to a threshold. We know that threshold is about five people. Then somebody looks at that and says, hmm, I think Jackie said that. Well, no. See, so that's not going to happen. So what we're, we're going to, we cut, we draw the line at five. And so with five people, you're never quite sure who's saying what. And that's the whole objective to this. And that's what's going to happen. So either through access that the town has to the data, they can drill down all they want. They get to a number of five, it stops there. They'll get an error message. And we won't publish any reports or send any reports with any group of fuel. Okay. As time goes on, you'll see that this is actually the case if you haven't seen that before. The only other thing I want to cover off before we get into the results is the benchmark. So, especially when it's the first time you're doing this, it's always good to sort of figure out where we sit, you know, relative to other similar organizations. So over time, roughly 20 years, TileMap has done surveys with more, well over a million employees, and pretty much the same survey that you did. So we've got a huge database to compare you to. But not all organizations are like comparable. So what we do is we narrow it down to the municipalities, uh, the types of municipalities. So I can say offhand, roughly around 35,000 employees, 35,000 municipal employees, primarily in Ontario and in Western Canada. Uh, and very similar types of municipalities. So suburban, just outside, just outside a major center type of thing. None of the big metropolitan areas are in there. So it's not going to skew it one way or another. It's actually a very, very good comparative database. And you'll see how you compare it to it. All right. So let's get to your actual res results. The first thing is the participation. So on the first, the first thing you see here is, oh, my God, only 43% answered. Well, we've got to couch that, give that some context. So the average is 67. But what dictates that is we, we could send some of you answered by email. Not everybody could answer by email. And there was clearly accessibility issues. So the people, and there's more or less split on part-time, full-time. So amongst the full-time employees, as Neil said, the response rate was actually very high. It was well over 80%. It's the people who didn't have necessarily email access that we had accessibility issues. So if you can't find the survey, it's pretty hard to do the survey. What I don't want are people to leave this room and say, ooh, our response rate was 43%. Most people didn't answer, so they're pissed off. That's not the case at all, not at all, okay? It's really, it was a question of accessibility more than anything else, okay? So just keep that, bear that in mind. All right, getting to the actual level of engagement. So the magic number for the town of Richmond Hill is 70. Seven in 10 of you fit that description of engagement that I was talking about before. Going the extra mile, bending over backwards, how do we know? What we do is we measure how many people hold those fundamental attitudes that are going to make you want to go the extra mile? Are you proud to tell others that you work here? Are you optimistic about the future? Would you recommend the town of Richmond Hill to a friend as a great place to work? Are you inspired? Um, would do you get a sense of personal accomplishment? Those f six fundamental attitudes, if you feel those things, you're going to want to go the extra mile. 
And so what we have here is for each of those questions you see in the green box, the percentage of people who hold those attitudes. They agreed or they strongly agreed with that statement. And on the top, overall, that's the average. So some, you, some might agree with some and be in the middle on others, so not everybody's going to agree with everything, but most people will fit into all of those categories. So that's why you see a lot of commonality. It doesn't deviate very much. So the green is good, 70%. 7 in 10, that's really strong. On the right hand side, you see how that differs from the overall benchmark average. So you're pretty much right on the average, 1% above. The average is 69. So that's how that works. The most important category here, although yes, 7 in 10 engaged, that's great, the blue. The blue are those folks who said, on average, they neither agree nor disagree with that particular statement. So why would someone answer, I neither agree nor disagree? Well, usually, it's because you're conflicted. It's because, hmm, there's some reasons I'm proud to work here. There's other reasons I'm not proud to work here. There's some reasons I get a sense of personal accomplishment. Other reasons, no. So I'm in the middle. I can't say for sure one way or the other. So I'm going to put neither agree nor disagree. The key to remember about those folks is they haven't, they're not inspired enough, they're not proud enough, they're not optimistic enough to exhibit those behaviors. They're on the fence. They could be swayed, however. The attitudes are flexible. They're being held back by something that's saying, well, what, the reason that I'm not proud is, or the reason I'm not optimistic is, and we'll find out what those are a little bit later on. If we address those, we can get more people to engage, to feel those attitudes, to do those things. So they're on the fence. We can sway them. And that's a lot of people. That's 20%. Right? I could probably draw a line right there and say, Shh, all those people are in blue. Right? I don't know that for sure. I have no clue. But it doesn't matter. And then you got our orange folks. Who are they? Well, I can't tell you who they are, but I can tell you what they're like. The 9% in orange are those folks we call actively disengaged. These folks, unfortunately, have endured enough negative experience over time in the organization that they no longer feel proud to work here. They no longer feel optimistic. They no longer feel inspired. And so they actually disagreed with those statements. That's what that means. And on average, there's about 9%, 9 less than 10 Every single organization has some of these folks in it. I have never, ever seen zero. All right? So you, it's something that everybody lives with. Obviously, the fewer the better. But are these bad people? No, they're not bad people. Right? Are they poor performers? That's another myth. No, not necessarily. They're not poor performers. They might be, but they're not. Just because they're disengaged does not mean they perform poorly. Right? What they are essentially are folks who have, over time, become cynical and jaded. And we probably know some of those folks, maybe not here, maybe in other organizations. But once you get into that rut, and there's nothing about the organization that you like anymore, it's a bad place to be. Not fun at all. I've been there. I've been there. And so the thing is, it's very hard for that person to come back and re-engage with the same organization. Something major or drastic has to happen. And usually nothing major or drastic happens in an organization like this. So those folks essentially, we can't put a lot of attention on. And it's the same issues, by the way. It's not, the, it's not they have different issues than everybody else. It's how they've reacted over time uh, to these issues. That's what essentially has caused them to fall into that category. So that's the 9%. Okay? So what we're going to look at, essentially, hopefully, is we're going to look at the 70 plus 21. We don't know who's in what bucket. We don't know, and we don't care, because we're never going to identify those folks. What we're going to do is we're going to look at what's influencing everybody to different degrees, and that's how we're going to improve engagement. So this chart just shows you where you sit on the curve, right in the middle. Right? You're not the best, you're not the worst, you're right on the average in terms of municipalities. Who wants to be average? We, we, 
What this means, it doesn't mean you're performing, it doesn't mean you perform on, on an average basis. What it means is a lost opportunity. Essentially, the folks who are in blue and in orange who are not feeling the pride, the optimism, the inspiration, are not going the extra mile and, and engaged as a result. They're still doing their jobs. It's just a lost opportunity because if they felt better, they'd be doing so much more. And not because they have to, but because they want to. That's what we're aiming. So, and that's what gets us up the curve. And you'll notice it's very, very flat. So only a couple of percentage points can zing us right to the right, right-hand side. A corollary to this is we, have, we also asked people in the survey, we asked you if you're thinking of leaving. Are you thinking of leaving and looking for a job with another employer? Why do we ask that? Well, first of all, because we, we can. It's confidential. And so you, you can tell the survey. You can never tell your boss until you actually decide you're leaving. So this gives us a really excellent gauge on what? Not the number of people who are actually going to leave, but the level of commitment. And the level of commitment is one of those engagement outcomes. Right? So if a lot of people are looking to leave, well, you know you might have an issue with engagement. The two do work hand in hand, although it's not perfect. And what we see here is right on the, just like you were right on the average in terms of the level of engagement, seven in 10 engaged, you're also right on the average in terms of how many people are thinking of leaving. Is it the same people who are disengaged who are thinking of leaving? Not entirely. You will have very highly engaged individuals who answer yes to that question. Well, why? Well, part of it could be, hmm, career opportunity, promotion. Part of it could be, hmm, let's see, um, I'm thinking of uh, taking a job over in Vaughan, they're paying better. You know, it could be, so very highly motivated, engaged individuals can also say yes to this question, right? Could be, you know, hmm, I hate my boss, can't stand it, can't stand her anymore, can't stand him anymore, right? That also weighs into the equation. That would be someone who's likely disengaged as well. So as you can see on the right-hand side, those are the four or five different generic reasons. We didn't ask why in this survey. We know that from our exit surveys. So now, apologize for the, the small text. If you squint really hard, you can see that what's on the left-hand side, safety, work environment, diversity and inclusion, immediate supervisor, et cetera, professional growth. Those are the dimensions of engagement. That's what we asked you about, right? each in turn. Each one of those is actually an average. So for safety, for example, we asked four or five different questions around how you feel about safety in your work environment here. Right? And as you can see, green means good. Green is you agreed or strongly agreed with a positively worded statement. Blue is you were in the middle, neither agree nor disagree, and orange you are in you disagreed with that statement. You're going to notice right off the bat there's a lot more orange on this slide than the previous slide. It's not exactly the same thing. So just like the 9% that I talked about in terms of engagement and those fundamental attitudes, very difficult to get them to change their minds. Here it's not so difficult. It's a comment on a specific situation that falls under one of these categories. So if I said, no, my work site, my, well, my work site is not safe, and somebody improves safety, I will then agree that yes, now my work site is safe. There's no mental hang up around it anymore. So that can change. And it's by changing these, the ones that are important, that we will influence engagement. Trick is we don't know yet, we'll show you, but we don't know at this juncture which ones of those are really the ones, the levers that we need to pull. We got a lot of balls here that we got to juggle, right? Some of them we're feeling a lot better about than others. Safety, Work environment, diversity and inclusion, which is really good. We'll talk more about that one. You may immediate supervisor, where three quarters are feeling good, one quarter not so much. Right? And you can see going, going on down the line. So you're probably wondering, hmm, I'm down at the bottom here. Talk to me about that stuff. Where, where's the dirt here? Talk to me about the dirt. Okay. So let's start from the bottom and go back up. Information and communication across the organization. This is the one that we love to hate. This is the one that, you know what? 46%, fewer than half, are positive towards communication in this organization. Well, guess what, folks? Look to the right-hand side. 
you're only you're but the same as everybody else. And municipalities in particular are very siloed organizations because you're providing very different services to different people. Engineering, parks and rec, library, etc. Not much reason to have to talk to each other. So communications across tends to be quite strained, difficult. So a lot of times we end up in a situation where I didn't get the email, I didn't know they were going to do this. Well, how come I didn't know about that? Why wasn't I consulted? They don't talk to anyone. We don't hear anything from ELT. Sound familiar? It's because it happens in, in pretty much every organization, right? And we see 31% clearly said, you know, I'm not happy with communications at this organization. The question we have to ask ourselves is before we dive in and say, there's our problem, we got to go fix it, we have to improve communications. Well, maybe communications isn't that element isn't that theme that really makes us proud or optimistic to work here. Maybe it's something else. And so, so many organizations will look at this and they'll dive in and they'll say, we got to fix communications because that's what's wrong. Well, yeah, there's issues. And fixing it might help certain things. Engagement? Question mark. Teamwork? Similar. Right? Compensation? Always at the bottom of the list. Always at the bottom of the list. Of course, the little chuckle, you realize that. Why? Well, because you answer compensation differently than you answer all the rest of them. How so? Well, if I'm answering questions on how I feel about safety, I can answer how I feel, how I feel, how I feel, how I feel. And you get to the compensation section and you read the first question. It says, I'm satisfied with my cash compensation. And you're about to say agree and we say, wait. If everybody says agree, what do you think is going to happen? We're not going to get a raise. I can't say I agree. So you got not everybody, but some people are going to go and vote strategically on this one. And you see that, and it happens everywhere. And that's one of the reasons why compensation goes down to the bottom. Now, if that were true everywhere, we would be the same as average, but we're a little bit lower. So there's something else going on here. It's more particular to the town of Richmond Hill, at least the area. And where are we located? We're located in the GTA. Lots of competition. Lots of other areas. If I'm looking at the county of Grand Prairie, there's nowhere else to go. If I'm working as the county reeve in the county of Grand Prairie, there's nowhere else to go, right? So what I'm getting paid, that's what I'm getting paid. So, but here, hey, maybe Vaughn's paying better. Maybe City of Toronto's paying better, right? Maybe Ajax is paying better. So there's a lot of chatter. There's a lot of comparison going on. Who's getting what, when, how, does my, how do I stack up against the other person? So that's going to influence, because compensation is relative. Interestingly enough, I can do, and we do, engagement for a number of firms on Bay Street. Where do you think compensation lands up for those Bay Street salaries and bonuses? Still on the bottom. My million dollars, he got 1.2. It's all relative. And that's how we evaluate compensation, right? So, and if those of you who follow sports and do the fantasy hockey or the fantasy football thing, see that as well, right? It doesn't matter how many, seven, seven million, I want eight. So it, it's all relative. Cool. Now we have to move, okay, short circuit. There's a lot of stuff happening between the last slide and this one. But those three are the drivers of engagement. How do we know? Did you tell us that? Yes, you did, actually. And the way you told us that was we looked at those folks who were very, very highly engaged. You scored strongly agree. I am proud. I'm very optimistic. I'm very inspired. I would recommend. Strongly agree. All six. What are you scoring also very well in those dimensions and all those questions? What's moving together? Professional growth is the one that moves most closely together with your answers on engagement. As they go up, as your, profession, as your attitudes and feelings about professional growth here at the organization improve, so too does your level of engagement. As it goes down, so too does your level of engagement. We call that in statistics correlation. They go up together. They go down together. The most important one, professional growth. So how you feel about your career, am I learning, am I growing, am I developing, am I making an impact, am I living up to my potential, is this challenging? All of those are really the big reasons why you would feel proud or optimistic or inspired to work. Diversity and inclusion. 
people are very, very proud of the fact that we tend to reflect the community, the diverse community around us. We feel included. And as we do, so too are we more proud and optimistic and more engaged. But if we don't, then the opposite's true. It has a big negative impact on our engagement. And our organizational vision is the third one, the third most important. If we see, if we like the direction the town is going in, and we feel part of that, and we feel we know how we contribute to that, hugely inspiring, right? If not, the reverse is true. So that's not me saying that. That's your answers telling me that. So all those little numbers, those percentages on the right-hand side is the full list. So I showed you the top three, professional growth, diversity and inclusion, organizational vision. What those percentages mean is if I look at employee engagement like a pie, right? what's the biggest slice of that pie that's going to explain what's happening to employee engagement? The biggest slice is professional growth. The next biggest slice is diversity. The next biggest slice is vision and so on and so forth. And you get smaller and smaller pieces as you keep going down. Less and less impact on engagement. Look what's at the bottom. Compensation and communications. Those big bugaboos from the last slide, the things we feel the most ticked off at, are actually the least important. Yet we would have gone through, if it, without this piece, we would have gone through and tried to improve communications. And we would have come back a year or two later and been no further ahead on engagement. Why? Because that's not the issue. The fact that we didn't get the email, that somebody didn't tell us what was going on, we, d we basically are really good at dismissing that and saying, you know, that's just daily work frustration. That's not the fundamental reason I like, am I proud to work here? Am I optimistic about the future? Right? So, but those things in the top are. And a compensation. Let's face it, folks. We're not here for the money, right? We accepted something when we started, and basically, if we got a bit, everybody got a raise tomorrow, we'd be really happy till tomorrow. And then we would be going right back to the way we've always done things. That's just the way it works, right? Is it important? Of course it is. We've got to stay competitive, right? We have to, otherwise we'd lose all our people, right? If Vaughn was paying all that much more, or Markham, or, or Ajax, or Oshawa, you have a, people will be leaving in droves. So it does have to, the market takes care of that, right? The labor market takes care of that. But fundamentally, you're saying no more than anybody else are, are thinking of leaving. So, you know what? It's probably pretty stable. Do people have issues? Sure, you do, right? But from an engagement standpoint, there's other fish to fry here, bigger ones. So we look at this a little bit differently. This should help a little bit. What you see on this chart, same dimensions, all right? So from top to bottom, the higher that is on the chart, the better we feel about it as a group compared to all of the other municipalities. So am I looking at diversity, respect, and inclusion? The average for all the rest of the municipalities is that horizontal line. So work environment, for example, is right on the average. We feel really good about diversity, respect, and inclusion here compared to everybody else. We feel pretty good about our supervisor, about ELT, believe it or not, about organizational vision. We don't feel so good about some of the other stuff, teamwork, innovation, professional growth. Those are below the line. But like I was saying before, not everything's important. Not everything has an equal impact on how engaged we feel. So as we move to the right, it becomes more important. So as you saw before on the previous slide, professional growth is the single most important dimension or driver of engagement. How we feel about our career is really going to impact it. And at the same time, we're seeing, you know what? We could probably do better there. So the opportunities for improvement are really what's going to be in that bottom right-hand quadrant. Important on the right, not feeling too good on the bottom. That's really our low-hanging fruit. If we look at what's there, you got professional growth in that red circle. And then down you got, oh, these two others that are sort of to the left, closer to the line, in that dotted line. I dotted lined it because they're not the most important things to engagement. Yet we're seeing that so many people are not happy about it that it's probably low-hanging fruit. If you fix that and it's sort of it's medium in importance, you will have that impact on engagement. So those are our opportunities for improvement. On the top, that's what we're doing well. 
And because we're doing well, seven in 10 of us are engaged. Diversity, vision, leadership. Right? So those are the things that are inspiring us, making us proud, making us optimistic, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to do now is I want to look more deeply at those because that's really the ticket to moving that seven in 10, getting, instead of having seven in 10 of us, maybe 7.5, going up to 75%, making more feel, people feel better, et cetera. Before I do it, there's one last thing I want to comment on this slide. And that's, I talked about compensation already. Work-life balance. Work-life balance, you're probably looking at that. He's, he's going to ignore that. We said that we, you know, that's clearly on the bottom there and he's ignoring it. No, he's not ignoring it. What's going to work-life balance, why it's there is because it's not the biggest driver of engagement. We don't see a pattern between how you feel about work-life balance and how proud or optimistic or engaged or inspired you are. Does that mean work-life balance isn't important? No, it does not certainly mean that. What it means is work-life balance isn't a driver of engagement. So if I improve someone's work-life balance, I'm not necessarily going to improve their engagement. But I will make them feel better. Mental health, stress, maybe they'll stay instead of leaving for uh, a more balanced job. It's not an engagement driver, but it's still important. Right? So this is a very, very narrow lens about engagement, right? about what makes people proud, inspired, and the other four attitudes. So don't conclude that, okay, well, it's down there in the bottom left, so we're not going to do anything about it. No, no, this is just about employee engagement. There's other things on that list that are important for other reasons, and they come into play in an, in an overall employee strategy. Engagement is just one pillar of that. So now let's look at the drivers. Professional growth. We're not doing too bad. 69, positive. Overall, you can see what are the attitudes that define professional growth. Challenging work, having the opportunity to do what it do best, learning and growth opportunities, career aspirations can be achieved, and make a positive impact. Well, people make a difference here. You feel you make a difference. That's clear. You can also see pretty clearly where there's more orange and blue, less green. My career aspirations can be achieved here and I have continuous opportunities to learn and grow. So, hmm, all right. So if we want to improve how people feel about professional growth and bring that up and over the benchmark, we're going to have to do something about that. But before we can, we need to understand why some of you are answering those things. That's just one statement. You said agree or disagree. It doesn't tell us something. It doesn't tell us enough. So then we dig into all the comments and really thank you for this because this is the gold mine. Right? When we look at those comments, when I look at those comments, you can start to see what people are feeling, truly feeling and thinking about these particular issues. So we're doing two things with the comments. The first is, I've crammed it all onto one slide because it's about comments. The blue bars. So what people do, what we ask you to do is you write your comments full text in the box, and then we ask you which category do you think it belongs to? And there's predetermined categories, so you tick the box. And that's what you see, how many people tick those boxes at the bottom. More advancement, more opportunities for growth, more training. So that tells us a little bit more. The gray dot happens to be the benchmark average for that particular category. But it is still, I'm still leaving wanting a little bit. What are people actually saying? So we read the comments. And you, after reading the comment, you can get a clear sense of, you know what, people are talking about this and that and the other thing, really. And the tone and, okay, so I'm going to pick a couple of comments that reflect that pretty well. And so the first thing is, you know what, remember 69% are actually in the green here, 7 in 10 people, right? So you have stuff like, overall, I'm satisfied with my organization's professional growth opportunities. I understand what I need to do to advance and I'm receiving the training and education I need to achieve my future position. So there's a lot of positivity in there. People do feel that they're learning and growing for the most part, but you had orange and, and blue there too. So what are they saying? Well, recognize growth isn't all just about promotion, right? It's, it, it can be revised responsibilities. So don't, you know, 
the town is only so big. It's only got so many managers' positions, and there's only going to be so many managers' positions because, you know, we can't invent positions because of all of the people who rightfully deserve those positions. So then, how do we get you to feel that you're learning and you're growing? Well, you can revise responsibilities. There's a number of ways to skin this cat, right? And then you've got the third comment, and this is really quite instructive because it was a real eye-opener. And maybe as you read it, you're probably thinking, oh, that's, that's nothing new. Well, to the outside observer, it certainly is. Allow part-time staff to apply for full-time positions as internal candidates instead of being treated like they don't work for the town. So that's just one comment. I could have picked out 30 or 40 just like it, right? All of a sudden, oh, there's a specific group that says, wait a second, we want our opportunities too. Right? We don't feel like we're, we have the career that we could get here. Right? Allow us to compete, allow us to have opportunities for those full-time positions when they arise. And you're starting to see now there's going to be in the, in the next few dimensions or drivers, you're going to start to see a pattern emerge about how the, those part-time folks feel. And remember what I said before about does the organization care about me? Does that person who wrote that comment, can you, you can read between the lines. Would you think that they think the organization, the town of Richmond Hill, cares about them as an individual? Probably not, right? Probably not. So now you see how it all works together. Why don't they care? Why doesn't the town not care about me? Well, they're not giving me a chance at the full-time position. All right, well, now we've got an avenue that we can look at as a potential solution. Of course, it's not that easy has to go through some hoops. You have a lot to say about it, but still, we can see where the opportunities start to lie. Diversity and inclusion. This one is really positive. Far right-hand corner of that quadrant chart. Most people feel really good about this. 81% on average. 87% say they feel accepted, right? Comfortable and safe. And we're talking about this because the more people feel positive, the more you're also proud, optimistic, inspired, engaged. But, by the same token, the folks who are not feeling this, who are on the blue and even the orange, who are disagreeing, they're the ones that are not engaged as well. That's a, there's a very, very strong relationship there, as we saw, second only to professional growth in terms of its importance. So what are people saying here? Well, if 80% are positive, you would expect stuff like the town is working towards diversity and inclusion. As for race, religion, and gender are, are concerned, this I give them credit on. It's a long process, but they actually do really seem to be trying. So a lot of comments recognizing the efforts that the town is making on this particular subject area. Interesting, if I were to ask you before I showed you this slide, what do you, when I say diversity and inclusion, what do you think of? Well, I think of race, I think of gender, I think of sexual orientation, I think of disability. I think of all the minority groups. How many people would have said part-time in that equation? Probably not top of one. Yet that's what's happening here. It's not necessarily race or gender, it's part-time versus full-time. The part-timers, and this, again, that's one comment, could be 20 or 30. You know, as stated in a previous section, I feel that the inclusiveness for long-time, permanent, part-time employees could use improvement. I'm as dedicated as work and, and work as diligently as, sorry, FT employees. I'm having trouble reading that distance. Maybe I'll try this one. Okay, so you can see the, the diversity here isn't around the standard minority groups. The diversity here is around the part-timers feeling more included. So there's another avenue, and we saw that traced back into professional growth as well. You can start to see that pattern. So that's diversity and inclusion. Number three, vision. This is the one where, you know what, not a lot of people would think, organizational vision, that's really what we need to look at for, to improve engagement? Yeah, because fundamentally, what many of us strive for is we want that guiding light. We want to understand what the long-term direct, where are we going as an organization? How can I contribute and be part of that? And when we feel that, we're gonna engage. And that's what you're saying here as well. But we're also saying there's a lot of us that, you know what, we're not, we're not feeling it here. We're not so sure. 
right? We're in the middle. There's some things that are, we see positive, but there's other things that are holding us back, 29% to be precise, right? And you can see their individual statements, whether it's you know, painting a compelling vision or understanding where we're going in the long term. It's all about the same, right? So what are people saying here? Well, again, you got some positive folks. I'm not only satisfied, I'm inspired. That is the poster child for this. You can see how it links together. That person, just by that one quote, you can tell they're engaged, super engaged. I feel that through the Hill Talks, email, newsletter updates, I'm kept in the loop and encouraged to work harder to make this organization the best it can be. That is the poster child definition of an engaged employee if I ever saw one. Right? That's what we're aiming for, for everybody to feel like that. Right? Next one. Well, some leaders have painted a compelling vision for our organization, and not at all. Hmm. As a town, we need corporate strategies that all departments adhere to, whether that involves customer service and or communication must be understood and followed by all. Well, wait a second. Now we're starting to see it's not exactly even. Depending on which department we're working in, we might be getting some, some of us are feeling it, others aren't. And it's not necessarily consistent. And so when we're seeing that lack of consistency, it's not the same for everybody. That's probably one of the reasons why we can't say for certainty, I'm positive towards the vision or I'm not. It varies. So we're going in the middle on that one. So, and then the, the third, there's very little information on vision within my department. Crews never know what the future holds until it happens. So we're reactive. So we don't have that guiding light or, or goal to work for. We're still doing our jobs. Right? We can still function, but when you have that direction that you know where you're going and you can see it and it's compelling, it's going to inspire you just like it did the first individual on here. So we can see there's, a, some, there's, there's some discord going on. We're not all getting the same message at the same time. So that's vision. So we have to talk about, if you talk about vision, you've got to talk about the ELT and how people feel about the ELT. I think it was fourth in terms of the level of, uh, as a driver, not third. Um, so you can see, same thing goes here. A lot of people on the fence. Some good, some not so good. So I'm in the middle on this. Um, why? Well, first of all, you can see the same thing, it dovetails with vision. Staff don't know the overall goals of the organization. It's not widely shared. We should really understand how our job and goals fit into the overall goals of the organization, which at this time is unclear. That explains better than I could explain what, why vision is so important. And of course, vision and leadership team work hand in glove. If you feel good about where the organization's going, you're, really gonna, you're normally going to credit the leadership team for that. If you don't, you're also going to blame the leadership team for that. Right? So that's why they're together. Now remember that discord that we, start, we saw in the last slide. You know, in some departments, not all. And you see quotes like this. This is just one. Again, I could have put 20 or 30 down. The ELT needs to resolve their conflicts to better lead the organization. Short and to the point, but boy, does it tell you a message. And a lot of folks said something like this. So yeah, right? So if we see, if we perceive our bosses, whether we see conflict or they're not getting along or not collaborating or they're saying do this, well, because we said we need to do this for Parks and Rec and don't forget, forget about what those other guys are doing, what are we going to do? We're going to listen to our boss. And so that filters right down to the organization, right? So we're not encouraged to share information. We're not encouraged to collaborate if we don't see our bosses doing the same thing. And that's what we're seeing here. And so, obviously, that's going to hold us back from feeling that true level of optimism and inspiration and being proud. We're part of the way there, but we're not all the way there. And of course, if we're getting those signals from the top, how then is that going to translate to teamwork? Now, we saw where teamwork was compared to the benchmark. It was right down at the bottom of that chart, right? Not the most important, but certainly close to the bottom. You see all that orange there. Right? A lot of people are disagreeing with those statements. You know, there's a strong feeling of team spirit and cooperation in this organization. 35% disagree with that statement. Saying, no, that's not true. People share information willingly. 26% disagree. So obviously, there's some barriers there. There are very, very thick entrenched silos going on. 
Silos are normal. They exist. They're a coping mechanism. Every organization has to have them because you've got to focus on what you've got to do and somebody else has got to focus on what they've got to do. Where it becomes a barrier is when you've got people working in the interest of the silo as opposed to the interest of the organization. And what some people are saying here is that our leaders are doing the latter, not the former. And they're not necessarily collaborating the way we think they should. So that's obviously having an impact on teamwork. And so when you look at the comments, you see lots of stuff like this. There's good team within my division, teamwork within my division. We work really well together. But there are many divisions or departments that don't share enough information, don't work like we're all part of one team, they're infighting. Everyone within the town should work together at all times for the better of the corporation. So that's where we want to be. It's the employee saying that. That's not coming from ELT, right? That's the employee saying that. And you can see why. So it all traces back together. The dots are pretty easy to connect here. The last one, innovation. It's a little bit different than the rest. Now, innovation is not about having the, the best tech, the best toys, you know, the making, we're a town, so we're not inventing products, but it's not about that either. What it's about is can we put an idea forward and it will be taken seriously? Can I change and make an improvement to what I do and how I do it, you know, and that will be at least considered if not necessarily accepted? Or is someone telling me, no, 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 do it the other way, we've always done it. Or they say something like, you know, we tried this in 2010, didn't work, so just do it the way I'm telling you to. What's that do to why my creativity, my ideas? It, doesn't, it, it, it shuts us down. Right? We don't want, at, a, at some point we're going to say, well, I'm not going to stick my neck out anymore. Right? If, if I'm just told just to do, keep doing what I'm doing, don't try anything new. So when you look at the comments, that's exactly what people are saying. People are stuck in their ways. Work is done, done well. However, people are hesitant to make changes when opportunity presents itself. In addition, many people see failure not as an opportunity to learn, but a way of shaming someone. So if somebody makes a mistake, right, and they're afraid that they're going to get blamed, and that there's rather than how can we do it better the next time, it's who's responsible for that type of approach. Well, you know, nobody's going to want to make a mistake. So hey, I keep my head down, just do my job. And what does that mean? Keep my head down, just do my job, is not going the extra mile, not bending over backwards, not engaged. Majority of things I suggest would modernize anything we do, and all my work is public facing, is shut down. Right? So a lot of the people, when you feel like that, when you feel shut down, obviously you're saying exactly what I've been talking about before. So that's innovation. And of course, that had sort of a medium impact, but it was down on the list. So improvements here might improve engagement. So that's the story. I mean, essentially, there's a lot of other balls that we could have thrown up there, right? A lot of other issues that you brought up. But the ones that are having the big impact on engagement are primarily the top three. Diversity and inclusion, a very good positive. But for the people who are not feeling included, it's having a big detrimental impact. That is not exclusively, but a lot of part-timers feel that way, especially the permanent part-timers, the long-term ones. Vision, we want that guiding light. You know, it's important to see where we're going and to feel part of that. Most people get it. Most people get it, but some people don't. And if we don't, then again, that's going to take away from that level of engagement. Leadership. Well, if we see, you know, for the most part, it's good. It was right up there in the top, hand, top right hand corner, but some people are saying, you know what? Uh, they're not getting along. They're not collaborating. So how can we? And that folds right into the teamwork. Right? Within, great. Between, not so much, right? And an innovation I just talked about. So on that note, I'm going to stop and uh, see if you got any questions. If you almost ran around the hour. Started a little late. Questions? Come on, don't be shy. You don't bite. Yeah. Yeah, the department-specific results will be, we call it cascading, will be shared uh, in the next week, in the coming weeks and months. 
I say months only because it's summer. Normally yes. we go faster. Right? So. But yeah, that will be shared. Rob. So there's corporate results, and you can almost see how there almost needs to be like two levels of response here, to two levels of plans. One is the corporate uh, response, and then a departmental response. So we're working through that. ELT is working. We just got the results last week, so we're we're working through it right now as well. Uh, so we're trying to figure out exactly how we're going to cascade the results, the departmental results through the organization. We have meetings set up with the managers and directors to relate the departmental information. So, uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, but uh, so talking about the two plans, we're going to have a plan, a corporate plan, and that'll be embodied in the employee strategy. Um, and and uh, we have a, a working group and sounding board set up uh, of uh, interested people who want to help us out with that effort. And we'll likely, because it's summer, we'll likely start those talks in September, um, as well as the departmental plans that'll get rolled out probably in the early fall. So uh, we want to uh, assure you that uh, we're taking all of this very seriously and uh, we're trying to figure out what the best response is that, that uh, uh, the best response actually is the one that we're all engaged with, right? We all have a role to play uh, in developing the plans and, and making sure they're carried out. Our objective is, we, I'm, you know, uh, comforted that, you know, we're a, a fairly typical organization, but we're not in this to be typical. We're not in this to be average, right? We want to be above average. We want to be, uh, we want to be global leaders, as, as I like to say. And so we're not satisfied with the results in any way, shape, or form. We want to make sure that we reinforce the things that we do well, and then the things that really impact the organization and the engagement in the organization, we want to make sure that we have a, a plan to, to do better. So that's, that's where we're at. That's kind of the time frame. Uh, we're intent on getting the corporate results out at least very quickly as soon as we got the results. So uh, there's more to come. There, you'll hear from us uh, more as, as the, the next number of months rolled out. So. Other questions? It's great. If you have any other questions, you can always fire them to me and I'll shoot them off to, to Norm or whoever can answer them. So. And you got our coordinates, you'll see that on the presentation that we get at the end of the day Thursday. So it'll, yes, it'll be all available uh, Thursday, fr Friday. 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 Okay. <laughs> Libby's telling me Friday. Friday. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Couples.